Luke chapter 4. To read from verse 14. Luke 4 verse 14. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the rumor went out into the whole surrounding country about him. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he was brought up. And he entered, according to his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And having unrolled the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to preach to captives deliverance and to the blind sight, to send forth the crust delivered, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And having rolled up the book, when he had delivered it up to the attendant, he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And all bore witness to him, and wondered at the words of grace which were coming out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this the son of Joseph? And he said to them, You will surely say to me this parable, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard has taken place in Capernaum, do here also in thine own country. And he said, Verily I say to you, that no prophet is acceptable in his own country. But of a truth I say to you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, so that a great famine came upon all the land. And to none of them was Elias sent, but to Sarepta of Sidonia, to a woman that was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elijah the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but Naaman the Syrian. And they were all filled with rage in the synagogue, hearing these things. And rising up, they cast him forth out of the city and led him up to the brow of the mountain upon which their city was built, so that they might throw him down the precipice. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way and descended to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with authority. So by the reading of the scriptures. We have seen how the Lord Jesus came into this world. In Luke 1 and 2 we have seen many details in those ten paintings. And we have seen the first words the Lord Jesus spoke publicly in the temple in Luke 2. Did you not know that I ought to be in my father's business? And then we have seen in Luke 3 how uh, John's ministry started. He was the forerunner. So now we get to the public scene. The forerunner was going to prepare the way for the public ministry of the true servant of the Lord, that he would display the grace of God to his own people there in that situation, as we have seen the details in Luke 2 at the beginning and Luke 3, situation of confusion. And uh, then we have seen how the heavens were opened when the Lord, uh, as the Lord Jesus was baptized in chapter 3 and was praying. And the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form as a dove upon him. You have noticed then that there is a public identification of God with the Lord Jesus. We have already seen in chapter 1 he would be conceived from the Spirit. And so every detail in his life was led by the Holy Spirit. But now publicly the Holy Spirit identified with a man on this earth, with the Lord Jesus here. And also, God publicly identified and gave his testimony, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I have found my delight. And then immediately, he was tested in the wilderness. Before his ministry starts now, after this beautiful testimony given in chapter 3, and when he had identified through baptism with all the true believers in Israel, then he was tested before his public ministry would start. And we have seen that the last time, those tests in the wilderness. And so now we come to verse 14. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. We notice the last time in verse 1, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. That was his condition. Mark that the fact that he was full of the Holy Spirit. And then in that condition, he was led by the Spirit. 
not only into the wilderness, but led by the Spirit in the wilderness those 40 days. A dependent man, led by the Spirit of God. A model for us. We see the Lord Jesus in this Gospel as a model, the perfect model, of course, for us disciples today. How much we can learn from him and how we need to listen to his voice. And so when his public ministry starts now, you could say everything was accomplished, the preparations had been uh, completed, and now he returned in the power of the Spirit. Again, in the power of the Spirit. Where did he go to? To Galilee. If we compare the Gospels, we see that the Lord had already started his ministry in Galilee, in John 2, and also in Jerusalem, John 2 and 3 at the end, John 2 at the end, and then uh, the meeting with Nicodemus was in Jerusalem. And after that, we have to see this, the start of his public ministry, as we read here in verse 14, a rumor went out into the whole surrounding country about him. And perhaps uh, here we can refer to those words from Isaiah, that uh, those who were, and that is quoted by Matthew. You remember Matthew quotes always the prophets in the Old Testament to show the fulfillment of these prophecies in connection with the coming of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. And then Isaiah 9, we have this, Nevertheless, the darkness shall not be as when the distress was in the land at the time he at first lightly and afterwards heavily visited the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them light has shone. So that was the fulfillment of this prophecy right here, and that is recorded in Matthew. The rumor went out also perhaps because of what the Lord had done in John 2, and in, also in John 4. In John 4 we read how he healed the son of um, officials who, had, uh, who was working in the palace of the, of the king. And his son was healed. We read that at the end of John 4. Perhaps it was also already before this verse. Now he went out, in, this rumor went out into the whole surrounding country about him. And then we have this summary statement. It is just a summary statement. As we have seen a couple of times in Luke, he gives sometimes just a summary. And then he elaborates. And the section we have read tonight, we have then in, full, in more details how the Lord Jesus presented himself in his ministry, the ministry of God's grace that God had entrusted to him. So verse 15 says, he taught in their synagogues. It's remarkable to see how many times that is uh, repeated that the Lord was teaching. I think 12 times in the Gospel of Extension, and many times in Luke. And then, perhaps just a word about the synagogues. Uh, after the captivity, the first cap the captivity in Babylon, when the temple had been destroyed, they started to gather in synagogues, already in Babel. And also when they came back, the remnant that came back to the land, in Ezra, we see that they started this, or continued this practice, to come together in the synagogue. It literally means a place to come together. And uh, the difference with us is that we have been called out. We belong to the church, or the assembly, it's the company of called out ones. So we are not in the synagogue, we are in the assembly. And then, the end of verse 15, being glorified of all. Being glorified of all. This uh, summary statement is also made by uh, Peter, and that's really worthwhile to read in Acts 10. In Acts 10, when Peter speaks to Cornelius and all those who were in his house, in Acts 10, when Peter spoke to them, in verse 36, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, his Lord of all, you know, the testimony, verse 37, which has spread through the whole of Judea, and now notice, beginning from Galilee, so the public ministry, as recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is started in Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. Verse 38, Jesus, who was of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. We've seen that in Luke 3. And his power, that is what we have seen in Luke 4, who went to all quarters doing good and healing all that were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So here we have God's servant, God is with him, 
and he goes in the power of the Spirit. God is really with him. And he starts in that area that was despised by the Jews, Galilee of the Gentiles, where he was brought up. We have seen that earlier in Luke's Gospel. And then it is a comment at the end of verse 15, being glorified of all. So all realized there was something special with the Lord Jesus. They glorified him. And I was struck when I followed this word in the New Testament that it was it used many times in connection with the Lord. For example, in John 7, verse 39, that when he would be glorified, then the Holy Spirit would come. That speaks of his present glory. Here it speaks of the fact that he was glorified, honored by all. And so this word is used many, many times in connection with the Lord Jesus. It is used in Revelation 18 for the great Babylon. It glorifies itself. That is the condition of the Christian profession of making itself great in its own eyes and in the eyes of people. The Lord Jesus, he was great. He was not trying to make himself great. He was great and he was honored as such. Just a practical application now. Uh, when we honor or glorify, we can do that in our bodies. We have been uh, purchased with the blood of Christ. We have been bought for the price. First Corinthians 6 says, Glorify therefore God in your body. So we may glorify the Lord Jesus, we may glorify God in the bodies that we have received, redeemed one. That is just a practical note. Now let's start with verse 16 where we have then the beginning of this wonderful event that took place there in Nazareth. He came to Nazareth. In Matthew we see that there's a reference in the name Nazareth to two things, that he was the branch and I think we have commented on that in the past. And also, that he was a true Nazarite. There are, there's a double connotation there. But what I would also underline there, where he was brought up. So he is here in his hometown, where he was brought up. And the word means where he was uh, fed, where he grew up. And then he entered, according to his custom, into the synagogue. So we can see this custom, of course, as a good custom. And we can learn lessons from this. Some of uh, the people of God today don't have that custom. They come when it pleases them. No, this was the regular custom to go to that meeting. I said already earlier, we don't go to the synagogue, we go to the assembly, to the meeting. We are part of the assembly and we go to the meeting of those who have been called out. But then, still, there is a lesson to learn for us. This custom was a good custom. Secondly, we might see that the custom refers to the fact that the Lord Jesus was teaching and that it was his custom to teach on every Sabbath. However this may be, when we think of his youth, when he grew up, like in Luke 2, we see, of course, it was the custom that he would go to the synagogue with his parents and be under the sound of the word. And so we need to be under the sound of the word on a regular basis. This is a good custom. And then the second custom was that he was teaching the word. And then he stood up to read. We, are, we don't know. Later the Jews uh, organized the reading of the scripture. And every uh, Sunday there was a portion of the law read. But we don't think that some believe it was already used at that time, custom at that time. But I don't think there is really definite evidence for that custom. The custom was to read the scripture. But not that it was pre-organized already. But in case it was already pre-organized at that time, then we see how God overruled that then even this section would be before the people. But we have the impression as we read this portion that the Lord took this scroll from the hand of the servant. So the, the servant gave that scroll. Probably this was a scroll that was kept there in the synagogue. I don't think that every skin, synagogue had all the scrolls of the Old Testament. Perhaps there in Nazareth they had this special scroll and another place they had another scroll. The scroll of Isaiah was given. And then see the skill the Lord had. First of all to unroll this long scroll and then find this place that he wanted to bring out. And here he refers to a divine plan. As start of his ministry he refers to a, a divine plan taking Isaiah 40. In Malachi 3 verse 1. Here the Lord Jesus does the same. Follows the same pattern. He refers back to God's plan. Revealed in the Old Testament. And that's important. Especially for Jewish people of course. 
But it's important to see that God had this in mind already for a long time. And now the fulfillment had come. The moment had come, as you will see in a few, after a few words. Now, when we go over these expressions one by one, I would say verse 18 and 19, there are at least seven points to highlight. The first point I want to highlight is the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. When you read this in Isaiah 61, and you'll refer to that in a moment, we see three times Jehovah. Three times Jehovah. The Trinity was not revealed in the Old Testament. The Trinity was there. Just like in Isaiah 6. Three times holy, holy, holy. The Trinity is there. And so the Trinity is involved in the mission of the Messiah, of the Lord Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord identified with him, is upon him. We have seen that earlier. That is the first point. Secondly, because he has anointed me. We read in Acts 10 that the reference we have in Luke 3 here, the baptism of the Lord Jesus, was really an anointing. What does it mean? The Lord Jesus was always under the leading of the Holy Spirit. But now the Holy Spirit had set him apart for a very special service. This anointing was in view of a special service that would start now. And before he would start his service, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that is an Old Testament concept. The priests were anointed before they started their public ministry. And so also the king, and sometimes the prophet. The third point is to preach glad tidings. See, the word evangelize is used. To bring out the good news to the poor. This is remarkable to see that. And I can't help but think of this wonderful verse, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, that the Lord Jesus, who is rich, being rich, doesn't say that he was rich. No, he is always rich. But he became poor. Although he continues to be rich, nobody can really fathom the greatness of his person. He became poor for us, that we were poor to became, to become rich through his poverty. So this is the grace of God. Remember, Luke's gospel presents the grace of God in a very remarkable way. So the gospel is preached to the poor. Now keep these elements in mind, because what we will see then in the next section that we have read, those people didn't want to acknowledge that they were poor. They, felt, they thought they were okay. And we will see a very important lesson in this. As long as we think, oh, we are okay, we don't need that. That's for those, that's for this guy, that's for this lady, that's not for me. I'm okay. As long as we think that way, the word of God cannot reach us. So, keep this in mind. He was preaching to the poor. That means, those who recognize their poor. And then, the fourth point, he has sent me to preach to captives. So, he has sent me, that is a mission, a divine mission, God-given mission. So that was a very high calling that the Lord Jesus had, a very high mission. Now the word preach is used, it is to proclaim. Here is like the herald, like John the Baptist proclaims certain things. So the Lord Jesus proclaims something. What does he proclaim? Deliverance to the captives. Here the idea is not just a prisoner because of crime. The idea is, in the original, a captive is like a prisoner of war. And so the people to whom the Lord Jesus was speaking, they were captives. In whose power were they, in whose power did they find themselves in? Satan's power. They needed deliverance, but they didn't even realize the need, how much less they wanted to deliver. Later on in this gospel, we will see this in more detail. Uh, in chapter 7, for example, a, a woman who came to anoint the feet of the Lord Jesus, she realized her need. She was one of those captives. And the Lord set her free in Luke 7. A woman who was known to be a sinner, who was the feet of the Lord Jesus. In chapter 8, you will find another example of a captive, a man who was demon-possessed. Nobody could bring in the remedy. The Lord, he could set him free, and then the next day, and then the next moment he was found at the feet of the Lord Jesus, well in his mind, and closed. A wonderful deliverance. One more example, you find later in Zacchaeus was delivered from the power of money. How many people, also Christians, are under the power of money who need to be set free? Here the Lord came to preach that deliverance. The fifth point, to the blind sight. Remember in John's Gospel how the Lord said to the Pharisees, what was their problem? 
they said they were seeing and they were blind. That was their problem. And a similar thing we see here in this chapter. The people the Lord was speaking to, they didn't even realize that they were blind. But those who realize they're blind, they can receive help. They can receive sight. It's remarkable that these elements we find here, we find that later in the mission of the Apostle Paul. You can pray that these elements in his mission. And I'll just mention this point now about giving sight to the blind. If you read in Acts 26 verse 18, where we have Paul's ministry summarized, it's a wonderful chapter. I'll just highlight one verse. Acts 26 verse 18. Where the Lord called Paul, or Saul still at that time, to send him. And what does he say in verse 18? So he is now the Lord speaking to, Paul, to Saul in the mission that he would give to Saul, Paul, to open their eyes. To open their eyes. That they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. Those elements we find in the mission of the Lord Jesus are taken up in Paul's mission. And those elements are still relevant today. And when we turn back to Luke 4, we come to the sixth point, the end of verse 18, to send forth the crushed delivered. Those who have been crushed by whatever burdens. Remember in the King Saul, people were under heavy burdens, and other kings also. There were many people crushed. They needed to be delivered from these burdens. Today, many people need to be delivered from their burdens. Only the Lord can do that. The seventh point, is verse 19, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. See, here the Lord is to bring in God's program. The acceptable year is a reference to the Jubilee. It was the 50th year. Every seventh year, there was a year of freedom. And in the 49th, 7th, 7th, there was a year followed by the Jubilee, another year, and in that year all the slaves would be released, all those who had a debt, the debt would be uh, released, so that was the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, it might be good to turn back to Isaiah 61. I said, here we see the Lord's program, and in, in Luke's Gospel we see the grace of God, and we see that very clearly when we read Isaiah 61, from which we have already read the quote, the quotation. Uh, in verse, we'll just read verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year started at that time. It's still continuing. In Second Corinthians 6, Paul quotes the same verse. He says, it's now the acceptable year of the Lord. Here the Lord stopped. He did not continue. But what does Isaiah say? and the day of vengeance of our God. So what does this mean? The Lord at that moment stopped after he had said the acceptable year of the Lord. He came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. However, there will come a time that he will also bring the day of vengeance of our God. He will be the judge. The one who preaches grace, who preaches deliverance, he is also the judge. What does that mean? If there is anyone here who is not saved yet, it means this, today is a day of grace. If you reject the grace, if you think, well, I can wait, you'll meet the Lord as judge. It's very serious. There is no tomorrow in God's grace. God's grace is for today. And if you follow that in the concordance, in Luke's gospel, the word today is emphasized many, many times. Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. It's always today, not tomorrow. Today is a day of grace. But it's a very long day. It's a day that still continues. I said, Paul speaks about it in 2 Corinthians 6. Peter speaks about it in 2 Peter 3, about God's long-suffering. The day of grace is still continuing. The acceptable year of the Lord is still continuing. See, many people have a problem to read the scripture like this. They, they say you make the, the Bible a puzzle book. No, the Bible explains itself. And the day of vengeance is still future. That will take place after the rapture. So if the Lord comes now, and he might come the next moment, then the day of grace is over. Then the day of vengeance will start. We you know from Scripture that's, a, that's seven years. I don't know whether the day of vengeance will start right away, whether there will be some time in between. But Daniel 9, if you want to study this in detail, lays out God's plan in connection with these things in 
much detail. And there you will see also there is often a gap. Just in one verse you see a gap. Here you find then the third thing in verse 3, to comfort all that mourn, to point unto them that mourn in Zion, that beauty should be given to them instead of ashes. That is the beginning of the millennial reign. That is where blessing is introduced then. So this happens in scripture quite often. There is a gap. For example, the Lord speaks in John 5 about the resurrection of the just and the unjust. Did you know there is 1,000 year difference between the one and the other? It's just that in one word. The resurrection of the just and the unjust. Thousand years in between. And so here we have the day, excuse me, the year of the Lord, the acceptable year of the Lord. It still continues. And it is the year of acceptance. It's the year of favor. Now remember in Ephesians 1, we have been taken into favor in the beloved. God has shown his favor to us. And that favor continues to go out to people. It's the year of a very long, long year. We've seen how God has shown his favor in connection with his beloved. And I repeat what I said earlier, the Lord Jesus is the perfect model for us. He is the true son in whom the favor of God is displayed. And God wants us to be in his favor. That is the acceptable year of the Lord. The year of his favor. That's a wonderful privilege. We can't appreciate it enough. But the same Lord who preaches the acceptable year is the one who will be the judge. Here the book is closed. He rolls up the book. Now you turn, you don't do it now, but you can do that at home. If you would turn to Revelation 4 and 5 and 6, what do you see there? The scroll is in his hand. But there is a scroll of judgment. And he unrolls the scroll. The same person who brings grace, God's grace, will announce God's judgment and execute God's judgment. Everything is in his hand. It's very strong. And so here the book is rolled up. It is to emphasize the importance of the moment. But another book will be unrolled by him, by the same person, to declare judgment and then to execute judgment. Now what happened in verse 20 after he sat down? So he stood up to read the scriptures and then he sat down we see that often in the gospel the Lord Jesus was seated, for example, in a little ship, and then the crowd would stand in front of him, and he was seated to teach them. A beautiful, um, just a just a little sideline. The Lord Jesus is seated now in the glory, and he's the minister of the sanctuary. He is seated at the same time, very being. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. Imagine to hear such a message. Everyone would listen. You would hear a little pin fall was absolutely quiet. Verse 21, he began to say. Uh, often in Luke's Gospel we see that he began, or he was, he began. Many, many times. And so, this day still continues, as we have seen earlier. This today still continues. The today of God's grace. He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. And we have already noticed how careful the Lord is. He did not read about the day of wrath. He only spoke about the year of the acceptable year of the Lord. And that was now fulfilled. But I repeat, this is a long day. The day is still continuing today, till the rapture. Verse uh, 21, just another point, I highlighted already, today. This is a very important point. It is today the day of grace, not tomorrow. Although it is a very long day, this day will come to a close, and perhaps today. And you notice many times the emphasis on today in this gospel. Now this scripture is fulfilled. Many times the Lord Jesus refers to fulfilling of scripture. Already I mentioned uh, the way he announced himself, the mission is really to fulfill scripture. He emphasizes it. And then he says, in your ears. So they were hearing it. Very special privilege they had. But would they respond to this privilege? Would they appreciate the privilege? Lesson for us. Do we appreciate the privilege that we have? Verse 22, all bore witness to him and wondered at the word of grace which were coming out of his mouth. I like this expression, the words of grace coming out of his mouth. It reminds me of Psalm 45, where we have this wonderful song of the Beloved. The Beloved we're speaking here, or the Lord Jesus we're speaking here, he is the Beloved. In Psalm 45 we read in verse 2, Thou art fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. See? Grace is poured into thy lips. He opened his mouth, and he was a vessel of God's grace. God's grace was poured out through him. 
He was an instrument in God's hand to pour out grace. Wonderful. That's why everyone was captivated by these words that came from his mouth. The words of grace. And again, that is in line with the character of Luke's gospel. It is to bring out the grace of God. Now, when it is grace, it's not merit. It's not anything that we have deserved or that we have done because of which we use. And that is the crux of the matter. If it is grace, it's not deserved. So the people here should realize they didn't deserve this grace. And that is where they failed. We will get to that in a moment. So we see here the vessel of grace. Everyone is impressed. And then they said, Is not this the son of Joseph? Now human reasoning starts. On the one hand they are impressed, and the other hand says, How can this be? It doesn't make sense. It's just a fellow that grew up here. And in another place you see they were scandalized. Here, although the word is not used, similar reaction. And the Lord was able to read their hearts. It says here in verse 23, Ye will surely say to me, this parable physician, heal thyself. They were not saying that, but he knew what was in their hearts. And what does that really mean? Well, the Lord says it. Whatsoever we have heard has taken place in Capernaum, do hear also in thine own country. What does that mean? The Lord had done miracles. And so now they were saying, well, well, if you preach, fine, but then show these miracles to us also. And the Lord says, he takes that up, that very issue. He could not work these miracles because of their unbelief. And so the Lord goes to the bottom. He goes to the real issue. And that was the condition of their heart. Now how is this needed today? Many people ask for signs and wonders. The signs had been given. If you read John's Gospel, even today we have the signs recorded for us. God is not giving more signs than that. And those signs are enough. If we don't accept it, we would ask for more signs. The Lord will not give them. Perhaps he will allow the enemy to give them. And that's what's happening. If we refuse to listen to his word, then the Lord may allow someone else to come up with signs and wonders. In John 2, we read at the end of John 2, a very striking report. It says in John 2 verse 18, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou dost these things? Verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So the Lord gave a sign, but they didn't believe it. For they said, For six, for forty and six years was this temple in building, and will thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So this is the sign the Lord Jesus gave. One example, and so we find more signs in this book. Now, what do we read next? Verse 23. When he was in Jerusalem at Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So as long as they were hungry for these outward signs, the Lord could not really entrust himself to them. In other words, there was a word of God needed. There was a change that their hearts needed. Well, this is exactly what is the issue here in Luke 4. But before the Lord goes on, he says something in verse 24, and that's very important. He said, Verily I say to you that no prophet is acceptable in his own country. Uh, we read in John 1 that he came to his own, and his own accepted him not. Here is an example. He came to his own, they did not accept him. Because he had grown up there. And also in another passage we see that he was not well received as one who grew, grew up there. Now this read John 4, 44. Jesus himself bore witness that the prophet has no honor in his own country. So the Lord testified that he, he said that publicly because of prejudice. And so because of prejudice, they did not accept him. Very similar to what happened to Paul, Tarsus, when he came back to Jerusalem after his third missionary journey. They wanted to kill him. They did not accept his message. He grew up in Jerusalem. Verse 25. But all the truth I say to you, there were many widows in Israel. So now the Lord's going to deal with the real issue, what was in their hearts. Uh, and that bring, he brings out by giving those two examples. By speaking about the widow in Sarepta, Sidonia, where Elijah went, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. By the way, just a little um, parenthesis. This is an illustration of what will happen in the day of wrath. 
In the day of wrath, the heavens will be shut up, and there will be this famine. And even in that context, God will show mercy. But now to come back to the method here, the message is this, in verse 26, uh, first of all, it's God's sovereign grace that, Eli- that sent Elijah to the widow there. So that's uh, Sidonia. Sidonia was an area deeply involved in occult idolatry. This is where Jezebel came from. So that was a very bad area. Jezebel was living the same day. She came from this area. And now God sent Elijah to a widow there instead of to Sidonia. How can God do that? Because this widow was going to respond to the grace of God. There would be faith. The prophet would say, well, go and prepare this cake for me. And she thought, well, this is the last resource I have, so after that I will die. And then she did not say, okay, well, I won't, I won't do that. I want to keep it for myself. No, she did it. And that is her faith. She responded to the word of the prophet. And that was faith. Now, exactly that element was missing here with the hearers, the listeners. There was no faith to accept the Lord's message. And that is why they got so angry. So here the first lesson is the need of faith. And I want to uh, underline and highlight that by reading in Matthew 15, it is, I think, where we have another woman of Sarepta Sidonia who responded also to the grace of God. Matthew 15, where the Lord Jesus first had gone to the part of Tyre and Sidon, so it was at the border of the country there, where the Lord asked this important question to the disciples, the another occasion, in chapter 16 we'll see that, but here in chapter 15, he meets then this woman, and he doesn't answer her. She had great need, he doesn't answer her. And then there is a discussion, and the Lord says, after she did homage to him, and said, Lord, help me. Verse 26, he answering said, it is not well to take the bread of the children and cast it to the dog. But she said, yea, Lord, for even the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the table of their masters. What does this mean? This woman was ready to take the place of little dog, despised, in order to receive God's grace. And the Lord says in verse 28, Jesus answered, said to her, O woman, thy faith is great, be it to thee as thou desirest. What do you see? Faith. Now, that's exactly what we saw with the woman in the days of Elijah. There was faith. He received with the woman in Sidonia. There was great faith. And the Lord acknowledges that. This faith was lacking there in the synagogue. So how to make an application for us, how we need also to respond in faith to the things, the things that the Lord presents to us. And then the second example. So in verse 27, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elijah, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but Naaman the Syrian. See, why were those lepers not healed? Although Elijah's ministry was a ministry of grace, many miracles happened, but no leper was cleansed. Why not? Because they were not ready. And even Naaman was not ready, but if you study the history of Naaman, what do you find? Naaman came to the point that he would judge his own pride. Remember, he was very offended. The prophet wanted him to act upon the word of God. The prophet didn't want him to give signs and wonders. The prophet wanted him to act upon the word of God. And that's exactly the same need today. That was exactly the same need in the days of the Lord Jesus. Would people respond upon the word of God? Well, in order to respond upon the word of God, you need to judge pride. You need to judge self-righteousness. Naaman had brought a huge amount of money. Self-righteousness. Like the Pharisees, he would come with all the things that they had done for God, and they said, well, God better accept us, we have done so much good. On that basis, God cannot accept anybody. And so, it was not on that basis that God could help Naaman. He needed to go down from his horse and from his chariot. He needed to go down to the waters of the Jordan River and wash himself. And that was against his pride. It was against his self-righteousness. But he did it. And that's where faith comes in. He acted in faith. And that is what they still needed at that moment. And the Lord has done it. Like in Matthew 8, you find a leper. After the Sermon on the Mount, you find that a leper came and the Lord healed him. Actually, that was the evidence that the Messiah was there uh, among his people. So here, we find another Gentile. Now, some people think, okay, the reason why these people were so offended is because the Lord gave their examples of Gentiles. No, that was not the reason why they were so offended. The reason they were offended is that the Lord revealed what was in their heart, their pride and their lack of faith, and they didn't want to acknowledge it. There was still hell possible at that moment that they became angry. They still 
could have been helped if they would listen to the Lord. But they were like Cain. You know what Cain did? Acting, that is the religion of the flesh. The religion that wants to produce for itself on its own efforts. Cain got very angry when he saw that the Lord accepted Abel's sacrifice. Cain was jealous. And this jealousy we find with the Jews in the book of Acts. Paul comments on that in Romans. Romans 9 to 11 is a very important portion to understand. In 1 Thessalonians 2, he explains how they always withstood the word of God, the grace of God. So what we find here continued on through the book of Acts. But it's not only a problem of the Jews. It's a problem of the natural heart. And that's why I refer to Cain. It's a problem more general. They were all filled. It struck me in reading that it says all. It does not say only they were filled with grace, but all. No exception. That's very serious. Filled with grace. So that means they were controlled by this anger. This has happened in history past. In the book of Chronicles, you can read a few instances that people got very angry at a message from the Lord. This has happened in the book of Acts. When Peter spoke, the leaders, the Sadducees, got very angry. When Stephen spoke, they got so angry that they cast him out and killed him, stoned him to death. When Paul spoke in Acts 22, they wanted to lynch him. They got very angry. This rage repeated itself many times, and that can still be the case today with the natural man, the religious man, of course. This is the religious man who responds, who reacts this way, who wants to do something in his own efforts. Hearing these things, they got filled with anger. So people today, they are smart, you know, they say, hey, you have to talk about what people like to hear. So what is the problem today? The problem today is that you don't hear messages like this one that reveals what's in the heart. The problem today is that you hear messages that say exactly what people want to hear. So then we are much further away. We are really in, pro- in trouble when that happens. Here there is a divine remedy, but they rejected the remedy. In our days, read Second Timothy 4, the remedy is not even offered. That is very sad. That is the day in which we live. Now, what were they doing then? They cast, they, rising up to 29, they cast him forth out of the city and led him up to the brow of the mountain upon which their city was built, so that they might throw him down the precipice. See the hatred, the violence, just like Cain who killed his brother. And so the Lord Jesus would be killed later by this religious system. But it was not God's time yet. And what do we see? In this gospel that underlines the humanity of the Lord Jesus, we see his deity at the same time. Verse 30, he passing through. That is his deity. And that is very much emphasized in John's gospel. I, I uh, checked at least four examples where we find something similar in John's gospel. But they wanted to stone him, and the Lord just left. Or he had hid himself twice with it in John 10 and in John 12. And in John 18, when the soldiers come, this the, the, the servant of the religious people, when they want to arrest the Lord Jesus, he speaks to them, I am. What happened? They fall down before him. So there we see again his divine power. But then the moment had come that he gave himself to become ultimately the, the sacrifice. So here, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Even here, in this situation, we read later in Mark's gospel that he would come back. He couldn't do anything because of his un- their unbelief. So the Lord has come back later, Mark 6. And even then, there was no change. He could not do much because of their unbelief. Verse 31, and descended to Capernaum. I know from Luke's gospel, I think, uh, at another place, chapter 5 probably. Well, you'll see that then later, or another reference. <laughs> that this was the place where the Lord Jesus had an apartment, or a little dwelling, where he used to live. The city of Galilee. And taught them. You notice again? The Lord was teaching. He was not discouraged by this response. He continued on. There's another lesson for us. The Lord continued on. But not to the same people. He was not throwing pearls to the swine. He did not continue on with those people. Although he went back once more time, as we notice. But he continued his ministry there in Capernaum and taught them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his doctrine. Verse 32. Isn't that beautiful to see? The response that we have seen already earlier in John 2, that um, a work in the heart is needed. And that example is given in John 3, in connection with Nicodemus. But now, where, why were they so surprised? Why were they so astonished? I want to give a little comment there on verse 32. It says, for his word was with authority. So, 
his teaching, they were astounded, and because he taught with authority, his word was with authority. See, in those days, the teachers had the habit to quote other rabbis, and that's still often the case in the Orthodox Jewish world. They quote other rabbis, Rabbi so and so, and Rabbi so and so, and Rabbi so and so. So they don't bring the word of God, and that is what's still lacking today. Often people come with man's opinions instead of what the Lord says. What does the word say? That's our safeguard. We need to go back all the time to the word of God. Secondly, why was his word with authority? So first of all, he did not just repeat what the rabbis had said. He let the word of God speak. And the word of God is like a sword. It was sufficient for Satan. We have seen that the last time. Satan accepted one word of scripture as sufficient. Now Satan accepts that. We better use this sword, this word. Second reason why it was with authority, uh, just, just a little thing. Uh, someone asked once a brother if he um, needed to uh, defend the word of God. He said, no, it's like a lion. You just let it loose. The word of God will defend itself. You have to let it go. You have to let it work. And that's what the Lord was doing here. He just let the word of God speak. And then this authority is with it. Second reason why he had authority was that he practiced what he preached. In John's Gospel, in the discussion there, in chapter 8 with the Pharisees, he says, I am what you, what I say. So, his actions, his practice, was backing up what he was saying. What was the problem with the Pharisees? Matthew 23, they teach, but they don't do what they teach. That's why there was no, no authority. That's exactly because parents, if we say something to our children, but we don't do it, we have no authority. So we need to be very careful in these matters, that we be consistent, and that what we preach is what we do. May the Lord help us. So we see that these lessons are very relevant also for us today. We need to come in the acknowledgement of our need. Then God can help us. As long as we think, well, we're okay, God cannot help us. So we need to have faith like this woman in Sarepta. We need to judge our pride and self-righteousness like Naaman did. And then the Lord can help us. Prayer. Certainly, that is included. And we have to keep in mind, Luke's gospel is the gospel of grace. And therefore... The gospel that goes out to the Gentiles also, but not only to the Gentiles, also to the Jews, as we have seen here. They also needed that message, but they needed to acknowledge their condition. So and that's why, try to underline, we need the same resources that the Lord brings out here. We still need them, also as believers. Of course, we need them to come to him, but then also we need to continue to use the same resources. And that will lead, therefore, ultimately to the acceptance of the Antichrist, because instead of really dealing with the condition, they will want to have more signs and wonders. And so that will drive them into the hands of the Antichrist, who will provide these, these signs and wonders. So that shows the helplessness of man's condition. But I think, officially, it started here on this day, when the Lord said, today, this word has been fulfilled. So that was the day that it started. And it's still, the year still continues, up until now, and still the rest of it. I think the teaching was expressed in the miracles he did, the teaching, and the, we will see that the next time we're feeling in the synagogue, in the healing of this uh, demon-possessed person, and then also in the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, in those incidents we have an illustration of what the Lord was teaching, that they needed to be set free, uh, we saw this tonight also, the need to be set free, and I think the miracles are uh, then recorded to give us uh, a glimpse of what the Lord was teaching. Teaching, as I said earlier, his words and works went together. There was a perfect harmony between them. But you're right, many sermons are not recorded, except for the Sermon on the Mount, and here what we have here in the, syn in the synagogue, and some other occasions we have in more detail. But the other, other statements are just summary statements, and we don't have a verbal account. Yeah. But that also refers to his actions, not only to his words, in John 20 and 21 again. So it's a wonderful statement. So the Lord is presented as a teacher, as you say, he's presented as a prophet, he's presented especially in Matthew as the Messiah, and so he's presented in many different ways, and it is very precious to follow those lines in which the Lord is presented. Very rich. And that makes the Bible so precious. Uh, I remember a um, story, maybe you can answer this, there was a little boy in a meeting, and he said to his dad, 
They're always speaking about Jesus. Yeah. They have no other choice. So may the Lord help us to always speak about him and follow him. Why did he need to go to the Jordan? Yeah. So the Jordan speaks of death. And the Jordan River speaks therefore uh, of the end of man. And so Naaman needed to come to the end of himself. And then, of course, God would come in, and we read there also that his flesh was changed, like it became a, a, little, a, a little boy. So there we find this renewal then also. So we find also the truth of resurrection in connection with the, the Jordan River. So it's an important principle that the Lord brings out. But brings in a new order of things. But it has to go through that, because that sets aside the old order, and then the new order is introduced in connection with the grace of God. But we have to come to the end of self.